Delighted to do so, and I think I've turned the mic on. But in any case, I talk fairly loud. And it's interesting, I'm gonna make a, 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 a quick comment uh, about your introduction in the, and your comment about Milton saying that Hong Kong had no natural resources. But there's a fellow by the name of Julian Simon, he's now dead, but he wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource, and I commend it to all of you, because China, ha Hong Kong had the ultimate resource, people, energetic people, striving, in, a, in an environment of freedom, and man, have they shown the world. Uh, the problem is, how do we get all of us to understand that lesson and adopt to it? First night I met Milton Friedman, I read him some poetry, so I certainly am going to start my comments to you by reading some poetry. <coughs> Hay for the Horses, Gary Snyder is the author. He had driven half the night from far down San Joaquin, through Mariposa, up the dangerous mountain roads, and pulled in at 8 a.m. with his big truckload of hay behind the barn. With winch and ropes and hooks, we stacked the bales up clean to splintery redwood rafters. High in the dark, flecks of alfalfa whirling through shingle cracks of light itch of hay dust in the sweaty shirt and shoes. At lunchtime under Black Oak, out in the hot corral, the old mare lunch, uh, nudging uh, lunch pails, grasshoppers crackling in the weeds. I'm 68, he said. I first bucked hay when I was 17. I thought that day I started, I sure would hate to do this all my life, and damn it, that's just what I've gone and done. I'm gonna leave you with a question, which I wanna talk about at the very end of my comments. Did he really hate his job? Milton, as I said, like poetry, his son David writes poetry. In fact, David has a phenomenal mind. Uh, he, uh, I think he knows by memory almost all of Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's poetry. So Milton agreed to do the TV series in 1977 in, in, in February. And of course, I'm running a public TV station in Erie, and I want to build up support locally and generally uh, because I, I didn't want my board to, to clamp down on me. I was supposed to be running that station, not running all over the country raising money to do this TV series. So I asked Milton would he come to Erie and speak to the Rotary Club, which he agreed to. So I'd met him in February. Uh, he'd come to Erie in uh, Memorial Day weekend to do some recording with us, uh, a screen test. Imagine that, I asked Milton Friedman, he had to do a screen test. When we did the screen test, which was Milton planting tomatoes and talking about it, afterwards he said, I can't do this, Bob. Well, he did it. He did it over and over and over. Uh, uh, and it worked out. By do this, because we asked him to do it twice. And it turned out, I think, the longest number of takes we had on any of his scenes was 24 or something like that. So I'm introducing him at Rotary, and I chose to read this poem in introducing Milton Friedman. Overland to the Islands. Let's go, much as that dog goes, intently haphazard. The Mexican light on it smells like autumn in Connecticut makes iris ripples on his black gleaming fur. And that too is one would desire, a radiance consorting with the dance. Under his feet, rocks and mud, his imagination sniffing, engaged in its perceptions, dancing edgeways, there's nothing the dog disdains on his way. Nevertheless, he keeps moving, changing pace and approach but not direction, every step and arrival. To this day, I think that comes awfully close to describing Milton Friedman and who he was. He gets up after that introduction, he turns to me and said, Bob, I didn't know you thought of me as a dog. <laughs> I kind of wasn't sure, and then he laughed and smiled, and I thought, okay. <laughs> But that tells you something also about Milton. He was a person, uh, 
uh, and I think uh, Matt touched on a little bit, uh, extreme humility. He went to the uh, White House to receive an award on his 90th birthday, and I mentioned this last year when I was here, and this time I have the advantage of having a chair where I can do it. We're in the executive mansion, we're all assembled in the auditorium. Milton had been in the White House for a private dinner with President Bush. They come over, they come in the room, and Milton comes in and sits down. <coughs> now, I'll have to try to do this. So it's like he's so short that he's kind of like this. See, he has toes on the ground because he can't touch the seat, and he's got his hands, and he's leaning like this. And the image was of this naive high school kid who was being honored and he just didn't quite know how to handle it. It was, it, and that was Milton. Uh, as he got older, everybody wanted him to stop driving. Imagine Milton, Milton driving. You got that image in five foot two, dashboard here, Milton driving. And he'd had two accidents, and, and, and he did not like the idea of having somebody drive him around. It just was counter to his sense of appropriate relationships with people. He didn't want people to do things like that for him. So he was a fabulous fellow in every sense. The first night I met him, the door opened. I said, Dr. Friedman, he said, oh, Milton, come on in. <clears throat> And I spent a lot of time <coughs> with Milton and Rose, and we also spent a lot of time debating over free to choose and what it should be. Uh, and Milton had this thinking that television couldn't be used to change people's minds. Uh, and yet at the same time, we had a debate. He, he appeared on the Dinah Shore, Shore Show, and he did have to admit that he thought that was better than on Meet the Press. He got more mail from his appearance on the Dinah Shore Show than from Meet the Press. So he began to understand the impact of, uh, of television and the power of it. But what he did do and understood was if we succeeded with the TV show, he'd sell a lot of books. <clears throat> and did we sell a lot of books? Those of you who are in academia, probably have a sense of today uh, when you come out with a book, Hoover Institution comes out with a book. I happen to know what they think is success because I've asked them. You want to guess? If they sell four to 5,000 hard copy books, they consider that a success. Free to Choose the first year sold 400,000 hard co hardback copies in the U.S. It sold a half a million hardback copies in the Japanese translation. And on and on and on it went. Now, uh, I, I don't have a, a degree in economics. I took one economics course at the University of, of uh, Michigan. I don't know, I, I don't remember zero from it. Zero, other than I think I can remember the building that, that I walked to to get to the course. I don't remember anything about it. Uh, but then consider this, starting in 19, well, essentially 79, actually 78, because I went to the Mount Pelerin Society with Milton in 78, <clears throat> because we were starting to work on it, <clears throat> on the program. I also wanted to meet Friedrich Hayek, which I did at that particular meeting. I arranged a private dinner in a private room with, with uh, Friedrich, and we became good friends. Did a series of recordings with him. Uh, any of you who are interested in that, you can find them at freetochoose.tv. And you'll, in fact, I interviewed uh, Hayek for two hours, uh, and there are many others who, who, who talked to him at that point. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the today, interestingly enough, I want to talk in some ways more about Hayek than Friedman and address uh, another aspect of, uh, of the whole issue of economics. Those of you who uh, might have attended my 
uh, comments last year, and if not, they are available. Uh, Arkansas has them somewhere in their video, whatever. And, and I, I covered some other ground last year that you might, might find of interest. And uh, those of you who were there last year, uh, I think you're going to find that I've tried to bring in some new things. But over those 30 years or so, here are the kinds of people that I would have dinner, I would spend time with Milton. Well, that meant I spent time with George Stigler and Bob Lucas and on and on, the Nobel laureates at, at uh, University of Chicago, I would end up at dinner with the, well, uh, I would say most anybody, uh, you spend much time there, you're gonna start to learn something. An old bromide about <coughs> uh, a pig will find an acorn if you let it root long enough in the, in the woods. Uh, so I kinda have this feeling, uh, I don't, I, didn't, I took that course, but I don't remember it. I do remember getting a B in it, which for me was pretty good because I wasn't a terribly <laughs> focused student. <coughs> and uh, uh, and uh, so I don't have a BA, I don't have a master, but I have a postdoctoral in economics. Uh, and one of the things that I say to everybody uh, now is that economics is simple, absolutely simple. And I'm going to say a little bit about that later, but now I want to uh, uh, conclude Friedman and move to Hayek, and I want to do it by sharing, having George, George Schultz share something with you. Beca and I absolutely agree with George Schultz's assessment of Milton Friedman. And if I can make this work, you will now get George's. Oh, I see it all. It went back all the way to the, okay, now let me see if I can remember. It's 1504X14, I believe. You without, have to share his passwords. <laughs> <laughs> no, it says, sorry, that password was incorrect. Come on, we just did it. Do you remember? Maybe it's 150214. Yeah, I know, and, and we had this all set up so I wasn't going to have to do this. Come on. There I got it. I just inverted the two and the four. Thank you. Rose, Milton. I'll get this Rose down here. I have spoken around the world quite a bit, and I frequently get asked in the Q&A part of that, People will say, well, you've dealt with presidents and prime ministers and kings and so on over a long period of time. And who has made the greatest difference? And so I ruminate about Gorbachev and one person or another, and of course, in the end, come. Well, what happened? Did I hit a button? I guess somehow I touched the mouse. Just a minute, I'll get it going. We're out of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and I get through talking about them, and they said, well, all things considered, I have to say, And I think you all know, and you could give the reasons why you would say, all things considered, when it comes to really making a difference, it would be and I suspect that Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher might give you the same answer because they have been powerfully influenced by his ideas. And thank you for all this is the later. things you've done. I have one final comment, and this is lightly methodological. Now, we know Milton's prowess as an intellect, as a theorist, but we also know, and has been brought out by earlier comments, how insistent he is that if you have a theory, you better test it with facts. And a theory that can't be tested better be reformulated, so it can be tested. And you've got to bring the facts to bear. So I know, Milton, you're tone deaf, but it isn't going to bother you. I'm going to sing. 
but you won't know. <laughs> so here's my, sorry, my methodological tribute. A fact without a theory is like a ship without a sail, is like a boat without a rudder, is like a kite without a tail. A fact without a theory is as sad as sad can be. But if there's one thing worse in this universe, it's a theory. I said a theory. I mean a theory without a fact. So, Milton and Rose, you have uh, given us recently a wonderful book, Two Lucky People. But I'm here to tell you that we are the lucky people who benefited so much from your influence and your ideas and your friendship. Thank you. Okay, let me get that out of the way. There we go. <coughs> now, uh, uh, Matt says, I know a lot of people, I do, but it's because of Milton Friedman. Uh, and George Schultz is a friend. And uh, I had my 80th birthday uh, in October. And my staff was puzzling, I, I assume. And they, they, had a, they got, me, got together a staff meeting. And, and, I, and I, you know, I tried to get them, hey, no gifts, anything. So I go to the staff meeting. And my chief operating officer walks from her end of the table down to mine and hands me an iPad and opens it up, hits the button, and George Schultz sings happy birthday to me that they had arranged. Uh, by the way, I then got him back because his 97th birthday was about three weeks after that. And I uh, went online. Uh, picked up, listened, learned the melody of the Princeton fight song. Uh, in Princeton town we have a team that knows a way to win. And then I recorded that and sent it back to, Mil uh, to George as his birthday gift. Uh, but the point about that is all the people that I've met would agree with, with George's assessment of Milton. But today I want to bring Hayek into the, into the play. Because I consider them probably, to me, they're the team I want. Because Hayek reached into areas that Milton was unwilling to deal with. Uh, philosophy, psychology, things like that. Milton had very strong feelings that Nobel laureates should not mess around in other areas. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, because the media, of course, would love to uh, have a Nobel laureate treated as if they know anything about everything, and the New York Times editorialist that we won't mention his name uh, is certainly proof of that. Uh, let me read a quote from a, this is Hayek now, I want to read a quote from Hayek that uh, was part of an essay that's part of the Heritage Foundation series of lectures. If you go to the Heritage Foundation website, you'll find an Ed Fulner every year Christmas would, would send out to lots of people a little pamphlet that was an essay by some notable. And uh, uh, I'm going to quote from Hayek. And the papers that you have at your place are selected quotes from that article. I didn't, we initially were going to think of printing up the whole article, but I said, no, let me just pick a few selected quotes. I want to read the first one to you. Faith has helped to preserve a hundred different kinds of belief, since all it does is enable a group to stick to their own set of beliefs. Which of the beliefs will survive and spread depends on their economic effect. First, I'd quibble a bit with Hayek in that I think that he probably would define economic m more narrowly than I would in terms of w what 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 uh, a aspects uh, of one's uh, activity or behavior are really going to affect their, their uh, uh, world view. But the important thing that I found about this, when I read his article, 
there is there is this there is this separation there's this gap between the conservatives and the libertarians and i think a great a great dimension of that gap has to do with religion and faith and you all know the name Christopher Hitchens, or maybe you do. And, and there are others who are the extreme nihilist, atheists, etc. And there are people, uh, I've heard David Kelly uh, do, uh, make negative comments about religious beliefs. Uh, I'm a libertarian, I'm not, a, I'm not religious, but I think it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. That, that, that gap is not acceptable. And when I read Hayek's essay, I thought, hey, here is Hayek touching on something that can be the bridge between those two groups. Because in effect, and, and by the way, I did, <laughs> oh, name dropping, I'm sorry. E.O. Wilson, you've heard of E.O. Wilson, social biologist. He and I are, are acquainted. We've spent time together. And in one of those discussions, we were talking about religion. And he uh, was very upset with Dawkins and that Richard Dawkins was spending so much of his intellectual capital attacking religion. And, and Wilson is not religious, but he feels that the religious drive is clearly part of human makeup, however you want to define it. Well, for those of us, and I certainly put myself in that position, who want people to understand freedom, want people to understand how having more choices themselves are going to make them better off than looking to a third party source for their welfare, somehow reconciling that difference is very important. And I think Hayek starts to touch on it here when he makes this comment uh, about religion. And as you'll see uh, in, uh, in the next quote I'm going to read, which I'm going to read a quote that is just the th fourth one down there. We do not owe our morals to our intelligence. Whoa. Now, <laughs> I think for Hayek, a Nobel laureate, a person who's revered as a, uh, a, 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 an accomplished scholar, to make that statement, I think, is interesting, powerful, and worth a lot of consideration. We owe them to the fact that some groups uncomprehendingly accepted certain rules of conduct, the rules of private property, of honesty, of family, that enabled the groups practicing them to prosper, multiply, and gradually to displace others. Now, what we're really arguing about, or what we're really examining here, is what's the source of right and wrong? Isn't that, isn't that what, what this, this clash between the libertarians and religion is all about? Because the libertarian will not accept the fact that there is any supreme being uh, that is deciding, okay, this is right and this is wrong. And when you carry their unwillingness to accept that to the extreme of, of Hitchens, then there is no right or wrong. Now, I'm concerned about that because I cannot envision a society uh, where there can be a civil society and exist if there isn't a fundamental grounding in terms of what is right and wrong. Because otherwise, it's Remington and me going at it, and he's going to win. Maybe if I was 30 years younger, maybe I'd have a chance. but. <laughs> And, but seriously, if you think about that, so although I am primarily focused on Milton Friedman, the economic way of, of thinking, um, who chooses, who benefits, who pays, what's fair, those important questions, I think Hayek raises, offers us an opportunity that's very important to reconcile the question of faith. I'm to the point where I believe that none of you are without faith. Now, in the common debate that goes on in society, I don't know how many of you here would say you're an atheist or an agnostic. I will. Ah, I'm rare. Okay, a few. I got a couple. It's 
So that's good. So you here, there's a lot of faith in this room. Now the question is for you to understand and can you help bring the libertarian uh, into some kind of a alliance with you by accepting the fact, I mean, I could carry it this far and say, well, perhaps it was the divine's means of communicating right and wrong to set up this process, emerging order, if you would, and we apply that term to economics, economic activity, and Hayek is saying we should apply it to our moral universe, our cultures, why we do what we think. Because there's the question, why, why is marriage sanctus, uh, sancti has that position of sanctity? Why is it so fundamental? Why does Charles Murray include it in what he calls the four founding virtues of this country? Going then to the next quote. Uh, and in this one, it's very interesting. The, the moral and intelligent one is, is the absolute truth versus nihilism. But here, here Hayek, he just astounds me. I'd love to have him back so we could talk about this. Thus we owe our civilization to beliefs that are not true in the same sense in which scientific facts are true, but are just as essential because it is due to our belief in them that we have been able to develop our modern civilization. So he is saying there are truths that are not testable. And isn't that, and, and how do we deal with those? That's a question of faith, is it not? I, I just think that this, and I, I wanted to introduce you to that uh, uh, essay that Hayek wrote and raise these, uh, what I think are very, very interesting uh, uh, perceptions and questions as we go forward to try to move this country and the world toward uh, more liberal, in the classical sense, societies. Uh, in the context of that, there's another thing. I'm in the business of communications. Uh, and one of the things we were talking about, I was meeting with the bankers at uh, Arvest, and near the end of our meeting, I, I don't know, I, may, I could say maybe I was an impolite guest, <laughs> uh, but I took them to task. I did, it, I did it in a friendly way. In fact, I did it after I told them about Winnie the Pooh. So I hope they accepted that. I wear Winnie the Pooh ties <coughs> because my, <coughs> my wife and I raised a granddaughter, which got me started on it. But this has to do with it's a symbolic of another challenge that we have. There are lots of reasons, uh, there are lots of ways you're going to judge what I have to say today. But one of them is going to be, what do you think I'm a decent person? Because if you don't think I'm a decent person, you will not accept categorically, I've lost the battle. I've lost the debate right at that point. Jonathan Haidt's work, which I hope some of you are familiar with, H-A-I-D-T, Jonathan Haidt, has done some research on this. He's a psychologist of great renown, uh, and, and that's the case. He's widely, widely recognized as a leading psychologist until maybe two years ago when he said that the past 10 years of research in psychology is worthless because the academy has become totally one voice and it's the left voice. That in psychology there is absolutely nothing, there is no real fertile ground of exchange of ideas. But then he went on and did research about well, how do people form their ideas and it was a wake-up call to the libertarians because you have the conservatives and the liberals over here, liberals in the U.S. sense, and over here you have the libertarians. And these folks over here, they are very much influenced, uh, uh, emotions play an awfully strong role in their deciding. And over here with the libertarians, it's the numbers. And so the lesson 
in my mind, and, and of course this is what, I come out of the arts side, so I'm all for the emotion stuff anyway, and working with Milton, in a, in a sense, that's what Milton did. He took you to places that evoked in your mind a positive reaction, and that you could relate to and gain experience with. The hand loomers in India, and, and, and what they were going through, and was that what they would choose to do, <coughs> etc. So the question for libertarians is, <coughs> you're not gonna win unless you learn how to open that door to people through an emotional relationship. At least get them to say, hey, you're a decent person, so let me hear it. <coughs> and I'm gonna tell you a story <coughs> about communications. <coughs> um, it's two brothers. Uh, and this is, I, I heard this story, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, so I can't vouch for it being true, but it's two brothers, and they are very different. One of them is very much into the arts, fine things. Uh, the other brother is, is uh, I don't know, I can't remember whether he's a truck driver or carpenter or something, he's working class, solid, down to earth, made a good living, etc. Well, the brother who's, uh, who's got all these fine interests, he wants to go to Europe and tour all the museums, etc. But he has a problem. He has a cat. And he loves, he's not married. His brother has a family, but he, he doesn't. He has a cat. And the cat is his absolute thing in his life. And he thinks, what am I going to do? I can't go to Europe and put the cat in some cat motel or whatever those are. <laughs> so he says, calls his brother. Says, hey John, I want to go to Europe. I want to do this tour. I'm going to be gone four weeks. And I gotta have, will you take care of my cat? And the brother says, yeah, so what? They, what's it, what is there to take care of a cat? Bring the cat over, I'll take care of the cat. Takes the cat over, goes to Europe. Calls his brother five days after being in Europe and says, hey, how are things going over there? And his brother said, oh, everything's fine. The kids are good, etc. Uh, by the way, the cat died. Well, the guy called, I mean, he screams at his brother over the phone. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? And his brother said, well, what are you talking about? Your cat died. What? He said, well, don't you know how to communicate, you nutcake? I'm on my, this vacation of my life and you just destroyed it. And the brother says, well, what am I supposed to tell you? Well, maybe what you could have said is, oh, everything's okay, etc. But, but we do have a problem, the cat's up in a tree. And, and then, when I'd call you back a week later, you'd, well, actually, you'd reassure me that you're gonna get something done to take care of the cat, uh, but, I, but I wasn't, that was, the fire department was coming and I had to go to my next thing, so I said, okay, I know you're doing something. I'm glad to hear that. The week later, I'm gonna call and you're gonna tell me that you got the cat down out of the tree and everything's fine, except, uh, I forgot to tell you, it was raining and the cat got a cold. But I got it to the vet, everything's fine, we're giving it the best treatments, be assured. And I go on the rest of my, so now I'm into my third week of the trip and I'm constantly a little frustrated and worried about the cat, but, but I'm okay. And then the third week, I would call you and you would say, well, we're sorry, my cat died. So you would have allowed me this nice, calm thing and I would have gone on my trip wonderfully. Okay, okay, well, so I'm sorry, your cat died. <coughs> well, is there any other news from home? Yeah, mom is up in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Communications, it's so critical to get people to open up, to understand and to get, give the time to look at the facts. Go back to George Schultz. Now, Hayek and Friedman 
I hope, you, I hope you got this message from what I've shared with you so far. Friedman would disagree with Hayek in, in terms of approach. Hayek was much more willing to use his own intuitive sense, his own assessment, and far less interested in testing a thesis. And that somewhat describes the difference between, to the degree that I my postdoctorate understands it, some of the difference between the Austrian and the Chicago defined as those two groups. I don't like to use monetarists because Chicago was far, far more, it's far more expansive than simply the monetary theory of which, and Milton was certainly much broader in his sense, even though that's obviously where he got his uh, Nobel Prize. Um, but being able to communicate things in a way that the average person understands is so fundamentally important to success. And I think Jonathan Hayek, Hayek, Jonathan Hayek has been helpful to me because I've been trying to say this to people around the country, or I'm trying to ask them, get them to give me lots of money so I can go and do another for you to choose, uh, that we have to use those skills of communications in effective ways to get people to just think, stop, think, consider these ideas in the context of their own experience. Now, why haven't we, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, <coughs> seen a decrease in government around the world? <coughs> We've seen a change We've seen a dramatic change toward uh, more uh, democratic societies, uh, more, more political freedom, but we've not seen any, any indication that the size of government's going down. And Milton and Rose and I, well, I didn't go with them. I'm always out raising money and the producers is having fun with the, with the Freedmans. Uh, uh, but but uh, sent Milton and Rose to Eastern Europe in uh, 1989 and did, and did a TV series or another version of Free to Choose in which they looked at Poland and Hungary and the Czech Repo Czechoslovakia at that point and, and how they were going to evolve after that. So there was all this sense that, hey, the Berlin Wall comes down and good, markets have won, free societies have won, but government keeps getting bigger and bigger as a share of overall economic activity. And before his death, Milton and I talked about that. And I, Free to Choose has one program, Program 5, that is not about economics. Anybody remember what it is? <coughs> it's Program 5. It is titled Created Equal. And Milton examines, starting with Thomas Jefferson, the concept of equality. And he, at that time, identified <coughs> the new understanding of equality that was emerging uh, from the point, I guess, of Marx onward, the socialist understanding that equality meant equality of outcome. And he makes the point in Free to Choose, it's a very strong statement where he says, equality of outcome is totally uh, uh, in opposition to any sense of a free society. Because you cannot get there without force. In fact, my favorite quote in the TV series is at the end of Program 5 where Milton says, the society that puts equality before freedom will get little of either. The society that puts freedom before equality will get a great measure of both. But I'm now talking to Milton in 2004, three, somewhere in there. He died in 2006. And I said, Milton, you know, I, I was raising this point. I said, I, my sense is we face a terrible challenge. And the challenge is how to get people to not, I guess it's like my biblical background isn't that good, 
but uh, I guess it was uh, the, the whole business with Moses and the, and, and the idol, uh, worshiping idols. I mean, people worship equality. And that's a difficult issue to, to deal with. We're trying to deal with it all the time. And I want to share with you a piece of video, <coughs> not George Singh. Joel Norberg is a Swedish uh, uh, scholar. He's not an economist. But <clears throat> he is the closest that I've found, Matt, to a new Milton Friedman. Not because, he's never going to win the Nobel Prize, and he's not an economist, but he totally understands the economic way of thinking. He's a Swede, and he is a fabulous communicator. So we've been using him for our public TV shows and uh, for classroom, our classroom segment. And I'd like to uh, play for you about an eight minute segment from a program we did with, <coughs> with him titled Free or Equal, in which he uh, addresses, uh, oh, get, get out of the way, I don't want to recover anything. And I have to do here, we tried to set this up as a link, but I've got to, oh, come on, where's the timeline? I'm going to start here, and come on, there it is, I want to go to 44 minutes in, and then we'll watch a little bit of this. If I, 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 am I gonna run out of room with the mouse? <laughs> there I go, back up to 44. Come on. There. Benefactor from which all good things flow. Friedman was afraid that a bigger government would threaten the incredible results of economic freedom because the economy is not a zero-sum game. In other words, we're not fighting over ever smaller pieces of the pie. The pie is constantly growing larger as people and businesses become more productive. And the world is getting wealthier all the time. In the last 100 years, with relatively free markets, we have created more wealth than in the 100 years before. And at 30, 30, 15, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, we have to look at what we can buy, how far that paycheck takes us. And that has increased dramatically because entrepreneurs become rich by constantly reducing the price of everything we want. Let's look at a couple of everyday items. 25 years ago, you had to work for 456 hours to be able to buy a cell phone. Today, after all the productivity increases that businesses and innovators have introduced, you only have to work for four hours. And of course, it's a better deal today. This is not just a phone. It also doubles as a texting device, a calendar, a camera, almost everything. In these same 25 years, the cost of a personal computer has been reduced from 435 hours to 25 hours. And you really couldn't compare it to those original PCs that wouldn't be able to run any of the software or the operating systems that we use today. What about a basic necessity like food? Well, we don't see the reason for dramatic productivity increases that we see when we look at electronics. The great leap forward in agricultural technology happened 100 years ago. But with a long term perspective, you certainly see a lot of change. In 1920, you had to work for 37 minutes to afford half a gallon of milk. Today, you wouldn't have to work more than seven minutes. And in 1920, it cost you two and a half hours to buy three pounds of chicken. Today, you'd get away with less than 14 minutes. Professor Friedman noticed something similar 30 years ago. Over a quarter of a century ago, I bought secondhand a desk calculator for which I paid $300. One of these little calculators today, which I can buy for $10 or so, will do everything that did and more beside. 
What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? Friedman's conclusion was that accepting differences of outcome does not just make the winners better, but the losers as well. People with a lot of money can afford to be early adopters. They can pay ridiculous amounts for the first versions of cell phones and personal computers. And that's a good thing for us, because they create bigger markets so that companies get revenue, so that they can streamline production and create lower cost versions so that all of us can buy them. And historically, this seems to be the case. Free markets regularly turn luxuries into consumer goods. <coughs> this may seem hard to believe. But the average rate of ownership for refrigerators, air conditioners, and dishwashers is higher among poor American households today than they were for all American households in the early 1970s. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively, and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity. The major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of society you have. It's the society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most. One thing is certain. Rarely in the history of man has freedom made such rapid progress as it has since Friedman produced Free to Choose in 1980. Whole populations yearning for freedom tore down the walls. Communism collapsed, the Soviet Union was abolished, and its satellite states were set free. Military dictatorships and the apartheid system were swept away. Most of the world embraced free market capitalism. Democracy spread and living standards surged. So, what really happened in Chile and China after Milton Friedman's controversial visits in the 1970s and 80s? Well, Chile liberalized the economy radically, put an end to inflation, and adopted free trade. And after a difficult period of adjustment, the country experienced rapid growth and improved living standards. The pressure for a democratic transition grew. In 1987, political parties were legalized, and in 1988, there was a referendum on whether the dictator Pinochet would remain in power for eight years. Pinochet lost and had to resign, and the country continued making economic progress under a center-left leadership. Chile is now a stable democracy. Here it seems that Friedman was proven right. Economic freedom created wealth, and wealth undermined the dictatorship. In China, that is not the case, at least not yet. The Communist Party still runs the show, and opposition is vigorously suppressed. Still, economic reform has made an enormous difference in China. It has turned the country into the world's biggest exporter, with the world's fastest growth rates. It has led to the greatest poverty reduction in any country anywhere, ever. And hundreds of millions of Chinese are experiencing personal freedoms that were unheard of 30 years ago. We'll have to see what happens next. As economies have liberalized, the results are stunning. Extreme poverty around the world has been hot since Milton Friedman did his show. In fact, more than 70,000 people have left poverty every day since the early 1980s. That's almost 3,000 every hour. 124 people every minute around the clock. But at the same time, with the widespread hostility against the free market system that made this possible, freedom is not the natural state of mankind. It is a rare and wonderful achievement. It will take an understanding of what freedom is, of where the dangers to freedom come from. It will take the courage to act on that understanding if we are not only to preserve the freedoms that we have, but to realize the full potential of a truly free society. Equality sounds good, and some value equality of outcome more than anything else. The risk is that the outcome is that we're all equally poor. Market-based systems have made all of us richer, but some much richer than others. 
in the end, we have to decide whether this wealth is the problem or whether poverty is the problem. As Milton Friedman put it in 1980, the society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. Hmm, that's curious. Thought the audio would stop too. Sorry about that. Well, I know how to do that. Where's the mute here? Yeah. Whatever. Whoever uses this next won't be able to get it to work. But <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so equality is a challenge, and government seems to grow. And how do we stop it? I'm not sure, other than, as Milton said, we have to continue to make the effort, both ourselves, each of us, to understand how does a free society work? Why is it that voluntary exchange is going to get us where we want to go, and me telling any of you how to behave isn't? Because that's really what it's about. Uh, I started thinking about this in this context, group authority. And, and I don't, by the way, I'm not, uh, I don't have any particular purpose here. I'm not going to write a book, etc. I just love to follow these various threads. And the question of group authority is, even, even as an individual, and here's, here's, I'm thinking out loud now, this is, I'm going into territory I haven't explored yet in this area, that as an individual with no other human being in existence, I just have this little inkling that I still will have to compromise. In other words, that I'm going to end up somehow in a debate with myself on certain issues. And I, as I said, I'm just, this is coming out right now. And the question then, for example, imagining myself in a situation of survival. Well, I'll give you an obvious one. In fact, it has to do with terminal illness. Does one, what is one willing to put up with to live an extra three or four months? If I'm out on the desert surviving and I have you know, some choice there, I still am going to have to sort that out myself. So that I'm going to drop that because I'm not sure where it's leading me. I want to go back, though, and quickly touch on the group authority because we all know that. This, we as a group uh, have entered into a, into a deal here. And there's been compromise all the way through. Uh, opportunity cost, for those of you who are economists or know it, uh, has been exercised. There's a gentleman back here who left his work site to come up here. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's going to be some foul up there, and he will have had paid a very high opportunity cost for having showed up. <laughs> but he made that choice, and I made the choice to come here <coughs> rather than to stay home and uh, watch the next episode of Suits, which I'm watching, uh, where Mike Ross has just gone to prison, and I am really concerned about how well he's going to do in prison. So I gave that all up. My wife and I will figure that out on Friday when I get home. So, so there's group authority, your family. I once have argued, and, and I'd be interested in your reaction. I had a board member tell me that wouldn't work, <clears throat> but I think it was because his child was unusual, although I think there is a tendency more and more today, <clears throat> and I don't understand this. Young people here explain it to me. Why aren't you, and maybe you will be an exception, and that's why I'm delighted to be here in Arkansas. Among my family, and I have eight grandchildren, not one of them showed an intensity about learning how to drive a car. They, they just don't have the same sense of, to me, that is, that's, that, in my era, that was the absolute symbol of freedom. I get in that car. Uh, I think parents are responsible for the next one. Why are 
young people not riding around their town on bicycles between the end of school and dinner or getting out with their buds and doing things because you don't see that happening. They're all focused on, and it gets back maybe to the media, etc. But those are all, there's a group authority going on there. There's peer influence. I've never smoked in my life for one reason, because I am a stubborn individualist. And I won't do anything because somebody else is doing it. And think about that. The pressure's on me. I think in my high school class, I'd say at least 50% of them were smoking by the time they graduated from high school. I tried it once and I thought, this, I can't, what, why would you do that? Peer-to-peer, -peer, religion, group authority. And all of these influences that, are, that, that you're under, and the point I would make there is <clears throat> our freedom is limited by our ability to compromise. And that, for me to say as a libertarian, has taken me probably all that postdoctoral to get to the point where I could say that out loud because to me compromise is evil. You have principles and you hold to them. But what are those principles? I think I've tried to touch here Hayek and his, his way of looking at that. Friedman, state a thesis and test it. Uh, and uh, ultimately rule of law. The one mistake Milton made in his life that he was willing to admit to me. Now, you may think he made the mistake when he helped with withholding tax <coughs> and he gets hammered for that. But he, he didn't think that was a mistake. Uh, it, well, he thought it was a mistake. He wished there wasn't withholding, but he, he didn't feel any terrible uh, uh, concern about his role in that. But where he missed it, back to China, was rule of law. Between, Norberg doesn't mention it here, but in Chile they observed rule of law. In China they do not. In China there are people who are above the law. And Milton said, <coughs> that was my one big mistake, that economic freedom by itself will not lead to political and personal freedom without rule of law. Now I want to go back to our friend in the hay. <clears throat> I'm going to read the poem again <clears throat> because only recently how I started to think about that question, did he really hate what he was doing? <clears throat> he had driven half the night from far down San Joaquin through Mariposa up the dangerous mountain roads and pulled in at 8 a.m. with his big truckload of hay behind the barn. With winch and ropes and hooks, we stacked the bales up clean to splintery redwood rafters, high in the dark, flex of alfalfa whirling through shingle cracks of light, itch of hay dust in the sweaty shirt and shoes. At lunch, under black oak, out in the hot corral, the old mare nosing lunch pails, grasshoppers crackling in the weeds. I'm 68, he said. I first bucked hate, hay when I was 17. I thought that day I started, I sure would hate to do this all my life. And damn it, that's just what I've gone and done. And I've had people say, you know, we talked about it, and, and, and I, it just occurred to me then and asked that question. Did he really hate what he was doing? I'd like to know what you think. How many of you think he really hated what he was doing? Any of you? How many of you think that he really liked it? And I love it because what it occurs to me is the lesson of it is you should judge based on what people do, not what they say. The fact that he was there, Buck and Hay, tells me he must have liked it. Now, he didn't like the fact that at age 68, 
it was a little more difficult for him to do it. Uh, I'm a runner. I am going to run until my body just won't let me do it. And yet, I could say, man, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I doing this when I'm two miles in, I'm going to do four or five today, and I just feel terrible? Because fundamentally, I get a benefit from it. I love it. And it's not now because of uh, fitness and medicine. I mean, I just love to run. So I think, and I think that's again another lesson that we need to keep in mind. I'm delighted you all gave me that answer uh, because I hope you then are applying it as you judge what's going on around you. I want to read one more poem and then go to question and answer. And I want to raise a different point with this poem. And remember, my goal is to convince people that uh, the ideas that, we've been, that I've been talking about today are ones that they ought to at least give high priority consideration to if their goal is to make the world better for most people. You can define better any way you want to. A box of pastels. I once held on my knees a simple wooden box in which a rainbow lay dusty and broken. It was a set of pastels that had years before belonged to the painter Mary Cassette. And all of the colors she'd used in her work lay open before me. Those hues she'd most used, the peaches and pinks, were worn down to the stubs, while the cool colors, violet, ultramarine, had been set, scarcely touched, to one side. I, uh, she'd had little patience with darkness, and her heart held only a measure of shadow. I touched the warm dust of those colors, her tools, and left there with light on the end of my fingers. Now, that's why I love poetry. It's power to take us into this sense of, the sense of the wonderness of the world we live in. And the excitement of being alive, of experiencing things. Where do the arts flourish and how do they flourish? And those who are in the arts community generally would be people who would be jumping up somewhere in this discussion and certainly in the Q&A and attacking me on various things and these ideas are crazy, etc. And I would simply say to them, well, go to the system you want. Go to Venezuela and see if you find a flowering of the arts. See if you find. And if you do, will it be the expression of the people or another tool that is being used to enslave you. Thank you all very much for taking time to hear me babble on. <laughs> and I'm open to any questions on, on personal about the Freedmans or about any of the thoughts I've thrown up, uh, thrown out, etc. And our construction guy's got to get back to work. <laughs> uh, so, anyone have questions or comments that want to share your thoughts with anybody here? <clears throat> um, could it be that the man, it's not that he loved what he was doing or he hated what he was doing, but he didn't realize what he was doing because he never sat down to think about where he was in life and why he was doing it? Yes, but if I think about that, I say, okay, at the moment, in order for him to say he hates it, he has to have come to some, he has to, you know, what motivated that? And if he'd said that to himself when he was, uh, he said he started when he was 28, I think. So if he'd said that to himself when he was 35, uh, I, in other words, I fundamentally believe that people, that among the choices they have, they most often are 
still where they are because they feel that's the best choice they have. Now, me as an outsider might look at that and say, gee, that was a bad choice. Why'd you do that if you hated it? And my own experience is this, uh, that I think, well, i give you another example. Mike Rowe's uh, uh, TV series, Dirty Jobs, if you've not, it's worth you picking, uh, watch some of that. And he takes you to people who are doing these god-awful jobs. And I can tell you, watching it, they like the job. They don't necessarily like being dirty, but they like the fact <clears throat> they have perfected that skill. And they look up, they get up every morning and say, <clears throat> and there's one I remember, a Chinese lady who could shuck oysters. And I mean, she could do it like wild. And she just loved it, and she'd been doing it for 15 years. And they used her to help train other people how to do it. There is a self-satisfaction from that. I'm trying to think, who's the fellow that's been writing? Oh, Arthur Brooks. Arthur Brooks has write, written a book about that, about what is it that people <coughs> drive satisfaction from. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought of an incident. This is real. I had experienced it. I'm going to tell it. Take about a minute and a half, which I think will start to answer it. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether he really hated it or not, but I don't think he did. I was in the Newark airport a long time ago, uh, and at that time, most of the planes were the turboprop doodads. And this turboprop plane, the one that the tail does not go down, and the baggage compartment's back here at the tail. And the floor of the baggage compartment is probably right about there. And I'm watching this fellow out there. He's all by himself. And he has, he has a cardboard box that is at least that wide by that and about that tall. And I watch him make five or six attempts to get that box up into that baggage compartment. It's so wide. And I don't know how heavy it was, but it, it probably wasn't terribly heavy. But you know, you got to pressure it because you can't get down underneath it. And he's trying, and he's trying. He finally did something like this. He got down. <clears throat> he was able to somehow nudge it up on his knees and push it up against the plane and then inch it up around by putting pressure on it. <clears throat> he got it in there. He stepped back two steps. He stepped back two steps. Got to have you watching. And he went. How many times a day do you do that? Or how many times a week do you do that? For all kinds of reasons. And, and isn't that really when you feel, wow, a step ahead, whether it's a tiny little achievement or a big achievement? And he obviously was telling me he was an expert. Man, he could winch those hay bales up there very fast. That's the closest I can come to giving you an answer to that. Thank you. Yes, sir. So you mentioned China and Chile. Right. right. So, I mean, I think as much, a more important rule of law, I mean, if you look at why Western Europe developed as opposed to the rest of the world, it's largely because of freedom of expression and freedom to share ideas and the means to share those ideas, right? Yeah, but those are, those are dependent on rule of law. Otherwise, the prince and the king says to you, Shut your mouth off, or I'm going to touch, cut your tongue out. Yeah. You, you, you have to have rule of law that prevents power from, from a, a, a having the free expression. Yeah, I suppose. But what I'm thinking about is so when capitalism started developing in feudal Europe, right? Yeah. You still had kings, you still had princes, but people began to get people like Galileo questioning that authority and a lot of them got punished for it, right? Yep. But I mean, rule of law is still. Oh yeah, no, 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 I totally agree with you. I mean, rule of law, <coughs> rule of law is like any other aspect of government. <coughs> if you don't defend it, you don't have it. I mean, even today, you know, you see all kinds of examples of people who have been <coughs> falsely accused. I mentioned this TV series Suits. One of the things I love about it is that the federal prosecutors are made out to be frauds and cheats and people who are prepared to do anything under the sun to, ca to catch people off guard and put them in jail. 
uh, it, it, it's it, so there is that there is that give and take. I've got a question. Uh, kind of add on to that is whether or not there's a rule of law <coughs> versus a natural law situation. It seems that you might have a bit of a apprehension towards natural law and its ability to effectively regulate a society or a lack there, uh, or a society with a lack of government. Um, do you feel that that's an accurate representation of just natural law by itself, not enough? Well, sort I mean, we, <coughs> we now have launched into an area where defining natural law could take us quite a bit of discussion and debate. <coughs> Let me go back to Hayek, because I think in a sense, Hayek is talking about a way that you might get at natural law. <coughs> now, <coughs> uh, the, 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 the critical thing with rule of law is, in my mind, is this. <coughs> to me, rule of law does not mean that the laws are going to be ones you and I would agree on. Rule of law means whatever the law is, it will apply equally to you and to Remington and to me and to Ken and whatever and whatever. And what that means is it applies to the president, it applies to the king, it applies to everybody. <coughs> and, uh, and, I, and I think in the United States today, we basically have it, but it is abused. Uh, and I did not just cavalierly mention federal prosecutors because they do do that. I have a very close associate who ended up taking a deal and, a, and another of his colleagues decided not to take the deal. It went to trial. The verdict was innocent and my friend ends up as a lifetime felon because he did a deal because the federal prosecutor put him in a position uh, uh, where he did not have, you know, his full rights represented. Uh, so rule of law means it applies equally to everybody. But then what that law is, is that's, we're doing a three-part series on the Constitution, and that takes you into a, another whole area of discussion. Yes, sir? Mr. Chair, sir, um, I'm, I'm sparked by your comment about the program. I've never seen it. But when you mentioned the overbearing prosecutors, I, do you think there are people, and I'm saying this because I already know my the answer I am, that are built or wired in a way that they they feel their their life is designed around doing just that, finding somebody they think is in the wrong, and just pushing it to them as hard as they can. Absolutely right. You feel that way. Yeah, Thomas Sowell wrote a whole book on that. The Vision of the Anointed. Those who feel that they are qualified to tell everyone else how they should behave and to make judgments on that. Uh, and it seems to me that the rule of law also is intended to take away the possibility that an individual will judge why you have the jury system and various other uh, due process, et cetera. And when I said the federal prosecutors, they're, they're bending the due process activity in order to put you in a position where fear of going to jail means you will agree to things that are not true, are not, are not really factually accurate in terms of what the situation was. Uh, I put it, to, here's, a, here's a comment that I make, and remember, I'm always trying to communicate in ways that people, um, I think that government, government's the only, only, only entity I know. Uh, Walmart, as big as it is, Amazon, they can't do that. But government can take away my life. They can take away my livelihood. And I, and I want government, I'm not an anarchist. But I look at government the same as I look at surgery. If I have to have surgery, yep, and if they're going to do me well, fine. But I want the minimum blood loss possible when they do that surgery. Obviously, I want them to be effective or know what they're doing. 
So I want the little tiniest amount of government I can possibly manage to, along with all of you, agree and that compromise that's going to do the job and help the person because, <clears throat> by the way, one of the lawyers in suits, he goes to jail. Why? Because he was, <clears throat> he got himself into trouble. I won't tell you how he got in trouble because that, if you decide to go watch the series, it was spoiled. But he, uh, he was focused on and wanted to take pro bono cases, et cetera, et cetera, which caused which led him into some situations which were partly responsible for the reason why he got in trouble becoming widely enough known that they could use it to put him in jail. See, it, it, it's a very interesting, uh, I, I've been very surprised that it came out of Hollywood because it has some elements in it that I normally wouldn't see in terms of their attitudes, et cetera. Do you think Soul, um, I, I, I follow Thomas Soul, but I haven't read the book you talk about. Did he think these people were wired from infancy, or does he think that that's a learned trait? I, I feel that they're wired from infancy. And I say that because in law school, I did, a, I did a, uh, an exercise. With, we were supposedly, some people were the, um, uh, one of the government agencies that, let's just, yeah. the government agency that can put the clamps on. Right. And the rest of us were not, and really those that could put the clamps on, that, they just came off doing it. That's right, absolutely right. Uh, two quick things. There's a, there's a teaching company course called, the, uh, I think it's titled Wisdom and History. Rufus Fears, Oklahoma State, now deceased teacher, teaches it. And the fundamental lesson, he says, you know, people think freedom is the universal value. No, power is the universal value. And he says, you look through history, and it's power that drives. And rule of law is the counter to power. Rule of law says power is going to be applied equally to everybody. So that rule of law stands between me and Rem if it comes to a physical confrontation. And, and, I, I, so I, and I do agree with you. I think, in fact, let me give you an interesting twist. I think one of the benefits of the volunteer army is to give an outlet to those people who have that tendency. And they can now go into the octagonal, is it, for the U UFC? UFC. Mm -hmm. So they can go in the oct they can go up and beat each other up in the in the in the fight ring. They can join the military, which allows them to vent that 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 sense of I don't know how to put it ultimate. But all of us have a ton have some of that in us. Lord of Flies and those things make it clear. I think to a certain degree, uh, what, what happened in Germany makes that clear that we're all capable of and very degrees getting sucked in to activities like that. Some of it because we're fearful. We're, fe we're fearful to stand out. Okay? Well, you've been patient. I, I'll stand here and answer. I'll answer questions all night long, but, or talk. <laughs> May I ask one more? Oh, sure. Can I bore you? You're not going to bore me at all. You made the combat, the compromise, I didn't write it down how you said it. Would, would you state for me what you said about as a necessity? Yeah, I, yeah, that's right. I've, I've come to the conclusion that, that there is no, I can't think of a way for a free society to exist. A society in which, well, let's just take this room full of people. That we are going to decide on a constitution. We're going to decide on the rules we're going to live on, under. I cannot conceive of us doing that without compromise being part of that. By compromise meaning that I, I come up with my idea, you come up with your idea. There are going to be differences. How do we reconcile those differences? It is compromise. Is that the same thing as finding common ground? Yes. Okay. Absolutely the same. But, but it's compromise in the sense that uh, I feel property rights is absolutely inviolable. But I, I can see a situation in which some people would say, yes, but there may be situations in which some other, uh, some other consideration ought to be applied 
other than just property rights. Now, I'm not saying that, that, I, that, that that's the case, but I'm saying I can imagine that. And then I'm saying, how do you resolve it? How do you resolve it in a democratic free society? And that's, I think that's what we're struggling with in government and we have all along. And unfortunately, recognizing that politicians, they are not, that's not the, <laughs> they compromise for a totally different reason than what I'm talking about, most of them. There, there are very few of them, and I've known, and Milton had some admiration for a few of them, and, all, and there's not a one. I, can any of you name a, a politician that has been in office very long at all that you started out thinking, yeah, this is the person. This is the woman, this is the man that's never gonna compromise on these things that we share in common. And bango, they get in office and they change because what they're interested in is getting elected. I wish public service, uh, public servant, that phrase were eliminated. Uh, we'd stop misleading ourselves about that. Yes? Now that I understand what you were saying, I, I want to get to my question. <laughs> Sorry. Which, which is, let's say we've got a bicameral system of government, and there are two, two sides, and you and I are in one group that believes, as we do, in yeah. freedom and, yeah. and all of the things that make what we are. Okay. But the other side is, Let's say they're like the other people we were just talking about. Oh, sure. They want, they want to hit with a hammer. Now, if I compromise with them, I'm going to lose a little bit of my freedom. And if I keep compromising with them, of course, I'll of lose course, it all. of course. But you're losing. It, it, but let me conclude at least. Here, <coughs> I was asked at this luncheon with the bankers at the end. They said, "What's the one greatest threat to freedom uh, in your opinion?" fascinating question which I paused on and then I thought back to Milton Friedman and in Free to Choose he said you want to know where the problem is go look in the mirror and that's what I think it is it is the aggregate of each of us in terms of how much we're willing to pay what is our it's not quite an accurate way to put it but what's our opportunity cost for insisting on X, Y, or Z and behaving as our role, in our role as a member, of, a, a citizen of this uh, political system. Uh, and that's where it is. And unless, and unless those of us who are interested in making the change accept and understand we cannot do that unless we convince millions of people to our perspective because they're the ones that control. It is not the politician. The politician is asked to decide a question. And I guarantee you, denials out the kazoo that the way they answer that question is public opinion. They test the wind. Where is, and the way, way I put it is this. <clears throat> if you look at it from a supply and demand point of view, we tend to think of the politician as the one that is providing solutions. But that's not the case. It's the public that does that, and, or tries to. The, the politician can only throw out ideas. If the public doesn't go with those ideas, forget it. The politician is going to run for cover and change how they vote. It's not possible, I've concluded, it's not possible to be a principled politician. They are contradictory phrases. And, and I'm not, and it doesn't distress me in a way. Because how else are you going to set it up? We, you want to go to, you want to, shall we go to Switzerland and have re, national 300 and what million people voting on every piece of legislation? We I, I think Churchill is right. It's a messy, not very effective way of organizing, but I can't think of a better one. I did meet a, uh, an Indian 
I think it was a Farsi. That was the one. No, it's an Indian law firm, Nishit. Nishit, and his idea is to use the internet to have run referendums, and that's how you would organize a society. I, my God, talk about a nightmare. It, so, so we're in this position where we have, we have representative government, and we just have to make the best of it. And that means we have to look in the mirror, and we have to put more time into making sure that when that happens, the wind that blows back reflects the principles that we believe are fundamental to a free society. Sorry, I think we should break up because everybody's been so kind. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.